Good morning. Uh, today is Wednesday, April 6th. This is a meeting of the Accushionate Board of Selectmen. I'd like to call the meeting to order. So moved. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. Please rise to the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, today is, in many respects, a, uh, a historic day in the town of Akushna. It's as we uh, conduct interviews uh, for the fire chief candidates. Um, you know, this is a, a small town, once in a generation appointment. So, uh, so Mr. Farlin, Tom Farlin and Eric Ruda, thank you very much for exposing yourself to the public, putting your credentials forward. I know that was a a long process for, you, for both of you. You put a lot of time and, and energy into studying and in some respects have built your career hoping for this moment. So for that, thank you very much and thank you to your families. I think this process is one I'd like to uh, publicly thank Chief Gallagher for his involvement in this and I think uh, you know this process should reflect um, his commitment to this town and, and, and his legacy that he's built, he's put on, put in an incredible amount of uh, uh, time, energy, blood, sweat, and tears to building this department in to what it is now, and whoever his successor is uh, will have incredibly uh, big shoes to fill. But that said, um, I think the board is confident in either one of you uh, to take that next step. So with that said, just so everybody knows what the process is. Um, Candidates have gone through an, a rigorous assessment, uh, test taking um, uh, process there that was used during the fire, uh, during the police chief um, uh, appointment, and the, the town felt that that was very good, very even-handed, and a good way to do this. In addition to that, there is a um, uh, the board submitted a number of questions, so there was a written component, and then there'll be the live questioning. Just so for today's proceedings, uh, we did flip a coin prior to the meeting in the selectman's office to make it fair so nobody was getting a, a leg up either going first or last or whatever and Mr. Arruda was the, uh, the winner of the coin flip and has chosen to uh, take the kickoff and he will uh, start the process off here with his questioning. Mr. Farlow would ask that you uh, leave the room and then we will uh, call you back in when it's all said and done. Very good. So good luck to both of you. I'm going to grab the podium sure. Thank you. Absolutely. So the board has chosen um, four questions uh, that we'd like to put before you. Mr. Gasper and I will, will alternate. Um, again, uh, hats off to you for the amount of time and energy that you put in. Uh, the, the information that you provided for us is really outstanding. And so with that, question number one, Mr. Ruda. Well, actually, why don't you just introduce yourself first, who you are, and then we'll get into the question. Sure, sure. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, good morning, Mr. Kelly, Ms. Leonard. Mr. Chairman, can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. So I'm Fire Chief Candidate, Eric Arruda. Been on the department uh, with the town of Acushnet uh, for about 20 years. I've been full-time with the department for 18 years now. Um, and uh, my involvement uh, with the fire department, um, the training coordinator, uh, have been since uh, 2013 uh, and uh, that's my, my heart and soul is in this department uh, born and raised here in the Christian and uh, I just appreciate the opportunity gentlemen to be standing here in front of you right now great thank you Mr. Lewis. Thank you. So this will be a good segue into the first question you did give a little bit of a summary of who you are um, but if you could just expound on that uh, why you're interested in the fire chief position in your overview, please discuss your education, your training, and your, your own experience in a little more detail. Sure, Thank sure, you. sure. Thank you. It's a great question. So, you know, uh, to start off this question, you know, why going for the fire chief? Well, we know the fire chief's retiring, uh, and the town needs a fire chief. Uh, and uh, for myself, uh, I'm a goal oriented individual, always have been, uh, very disciplined. And uh, I'm, I'm a detailed, focused professional when it comes to, to firefighting. Some of my main focuses is on quality, uh, to make sure that 
if things are done right uh, and they're done well. Uh, my hard working and commitment to education and training uh, is, is uh, kind of my heart and focus. Uh, with having an educated and a well-trained fire department, it's important uh, for the town, uh, for the citizens, and for the department members them themselves. Uh, we deal with a lot of different emergencies from time to time. Uh, we get a lot of phone calls that come in, uh, and, and I get it, uh, it's an emergency for someone, but if we have well-trained uh, firefighters that work for the department, it's just a problem for us to solve. Um, the, I've done some work uh, over the past few years uh, with a management role, uh, looking at uh, managing emergencies, uh, administration of policies, uh, being able to create some uh, guidelines uh, for, for training. We had a uh, purchase of a new ladder truck, uh, so was able to create the guidelines for the training on that and, and the uh, procedures to follow with that ladder. Um, the, uh, one, one thing that uh, I feel that I've set myself aside from uh, kind of the, the, the department, not aside, but just ahead, uh, I've always uh, pursued uh, the career t uh, of being a leader, uh, putting myself out there to be able to see uh, what's needed, uh, really, uh, whether it's asked of me or, or not. Uh, I've always tried to pursue that, uh, what's, what's needed aspect, and um, just take that leadership role, step up, uh, and uh, you know, mold my choices and my decisions that I've made throughout to be able to get to this position today. Thank you. Mr. Gasper. What has been your greatest challenge or your greatest success as a member of the Fire EMS? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Mr. Gaspar. So, one of uh, one of the greatest challenges uh, that we have, and, and personally for me, and as chief, I'd be sure to uh, really look at this and, and come up with a, a solution to it. Uh, it's really a no-cost uh, solution, and. I remember early on in my career, uh, when we look at the, the structure of the department, uh, it's the chief, and then there's 51 employees that are underneath the chief. And I look at, uh, in the beginning of, of my career, I was, I was trying to find out, I, we had some great leaders, we have some great, untalented uh, firefighters, paramedic and EMTs in the department now. But I had to try to look to these leaders and, and, and look to see who to follow and, and kind of fit myself in to be able to set myself up for success. So one of the things that's, that's challenging and to be addressed would be uh, a mentorship program. Uh, have some type of a mentorship pro program uh, that establishes the core values that, that we have and just really have a finer understanding of that, uh, you know, department-wide. Uh, and with that mentorship, it's going to create leaders, create opportunities for growth, um, and, and help really create, uh, you know, an environment for, for learning and education to be able to move forward uh, and know and really have a good direction. So I was fortunate just to, for myself to, to be the type of individual to take that advancement and to look for it. I understand that we have em employees that, again, we have great firefighters, great paramedics and EMTs, um, but without some leadership and without that, that mentorship, um, it's kind of just kind of a status quo, but if we have that, we can really develop some, some really talented and, and go beyond the expectations. Um, one of my greatest accomplishments with, you, you just want one, right? Yep. Okay. So one of my greatest accomplishments um, with uh, the Fire and EMS Department, uh, in 2016, um, I had a need that was, well, I didn't have a need. I had, I had the, the department had a need. I had asked the chief um, for training and education. Um, there was a, we didn't have a formal program. So there was no formal program. And I asked him if I could step up and, and step into a position and design uh, the, uh, the training program that, that uh, we use today. Uh, it's been adaptable and, and moldable throughout. Uh, but he gave me the green light and created the opportunity to have formal training and education within the fire department and that in 2013 that that morphed into uh, setting up the policies and guidelines uh, that we could get the commitment from the fire department members to meet a certain criteria uh, of 
competencies to be a certain type of uh, amount of hours a year in certain different levels of training. Uh, we monitor that, I monitor that, and uh, make sure that we're aware, keep the chief aware of, of our training and moving forward. So and that was almost an immediate success uh, once we started the, that discipline training. The employees, they wanted it, they needed it, they, they were striving for it, and they, and they couldn't get enough. And, and we shared a lot of opportunities to be able to uh, see what we can address. Uh, we've adapted our training uh, based upon the needs of the fire department. So for me personally, to be able to see that come to fruition uh, and to see where we are today in, in the developed uh, firefighters and paramedics and, and EMTs that we have uh, is something I'm very proud of. Thank you. All right, next question. All right, so you've had some success. Please walk us through a challenging crisis that occurred in your work experience step by step, including action taken, failure, success, and what you learned from that event. Great, good, thank you. So, uh, without getting into specifics, um, of too, too, too specific of it, uh, we had uh, also 2016, and we had a challenging uh, situation that affected the whole community. Um, the fire department was directly involved, and uh, the, the challenge was both physically and emotionally uh, that, that uh, we had to deal with. And it was, it was a situation with a family in town. Uh, they lost two loved ones, and any time uh, life is involved in, in, in a lot of situations, it becomes uh, stressful. But I can tell you, in a collaboration with the fire department, the police department and the school committee. Uh, we stepped forward. Um, we started a campaign to uh, make awareness of carbon monoxide poisoning and, and the deadly effects of it. Uh, and that was the, the issue for the for the the uh, really the incident for that that call was an issue with carbon monoxide. And uh, it was it, we just leaps and bounds. We we're able to uh, through uh, connections with Chief Gallagher. In, in his contacts that he made, we were able to uh, make awareness of these, uh, of, of the dangers of carbon monoxide. We were able to raise funds and we had donations pour in from the community in un unbelievable proportions, whether it was money or, or to go into this campaign or it was uh, carbon monoxide detectors uh, through different charitable uh, works and resources. Everybody came in, was able to uh, coordinate uh, the, the, the efforts of getting those detectors into the homes of uh, our community. We installed hundreds of detectors in, in over hundreds of homes. Uh, we were able to connect with people um, and see other needs throughout that. So it's challenging and it's, it's uh, horrific that and, and tragic that incident was. Uh, it, it really helped um, the community recognize uh, some of the shortfalls that we had and we were able to step up uh, in, in with a joint force to really address that and, and tackle it and, and really do some good work with it. Thank you. Thank you. If promoted to, <clears throat> to promoted to fire chief, what would you do in your first hundred days? Great first first hundred days. So I have to before I begin, I got to thank the uh, the select board for um, coming together with this process. Uh, you guys are dedicated to a uh, like a planned successor, as if. So we're not. We have some time. It'll be a couple months, probably. That uh, the the next fire chief will be able to work with the current fire chief to be able to look at and address at some issues and look at the needs. But within the first 100 days, uh, it's important that uh, myself get a handle on the new responsibility uh, that it that is being the fire chief. That you know you really don't have. Uh, particularly training uh, until you're actually on the job for, for some of those really fine-tuned uh, preparations aspects that you need. Uh, and one of the first uh, my goals of mine would be to an establish a relationship with the Board of Selectmen, a professional relationship with Mr. Kelly, uh, and Finance and FinCom to be able to get a, get a, a real aspect on the needs of this town uh, and we'll uh, be addressing the needs of the community uh, and the needs of the actual depart department members themselves. So I realize that good communication 
is really truly an, an important aspect for success with that. So if we can develop that early on. Again, I talked about a rapid needs assessment. We'll be doing a rapid needs assessment for the community, for the town, for, for the administration, and for the department. We're going to prioritize uh, prioritize those needs, uh, and then really get to work uh, to to start uh, you know, making the any any uh, adjustments that we need to, advising the town administrator along the way, uh, if needed, uh, in in uh, that plan moving forward. Uh, within the first 100 days, we'll also be tackling, uh, once we get that priority selection down, a more focused needs assessment um, with the town. And again, probably after the 100 days, I'd make sure I'd have a review set up uh, to be able to give, the give to the town administrator the pro process that we've, gone, uh, that we've gone through at that point. Uh, some of the immediate changes that we would make, and, th and this, this is a really a no-cost change, um, just reintroduce the expectations of the department in, in my vision um, that that will meet the mission of the fire department to continue to protect and serve this community uh, we will be looking at some policy reviews uh, using current staff that to be able to uh, have some input in those re in those uh, policies I believe that if we have the members have some input uh, it really helps create a culture of buy-in uh, and they can see the value um, in those policies. Some of our policies are a little outdated. Uh, and again, that's, it's gonna take uh, some time to be able to review those. Uh, there is some instances where we may lack some policies. And again, it's, they've always been a reaction uh, of writing policies, but I wanna be proactive uh, and, and really give the department members uh, the guidance that they need uh, when there's a question of, of a choice of what they need to do. Uh, I, I talked about the structure um, one fire chief and 51 employees uh, so be just taking a look at the structure and seeing how we can uh, get a better handle on accountability uh, again the responsibility is a hundred percent on the chief of the department uh, we like to uh, you know just address the accountability issue you can imagine a, a paramilitary style department uh, when you have one one person in charge with 51 followers, uh, there may be some missed opportunities in there. Uh, so we want to make sure that we can tackle that and, and be accountable um, for everyone. So some of the things that that if it if it does take a financial in, uh, impact or or a, or a low cost or no cost, ultimately um, I've inherited the budget that's already been planned uh, and agreed on at the time of of my hiring. And I take a, uh, a good look at the history of the budget uh, and then probably initially depending upon uh, the labor uh, labor union right now it's a lab there's a labor agreements happening with the union uh, if they uh, finalize on their agreement adjustments will have to be made in the budget and make sure that we have a that I have a comprehensive look at uh, that agreement to that will reflect a budget that uh, is sustainable and uh, at the end of the year, uh, we're not going to be coming back, you know, in a de deficit in that budget um, with that. So there have to be some changes in that. Uh, we do have two new full-time uh, firefighters that are going to be coming on. So it's just a man man uh, matter of managing that, uh, making sure that uh, we fill the gaps. Uh, that it's it's going to create some overtime and look for some creative ways to be able to fill, fill those overtime uh, needs uh, throughout, the, throughout the department. So those are, that's really the 100 day plan for myself. And again, I would have a, a review at the end of that process and, uh, and share that with uh, Mr. Kelly to be able to share with the board. Great, thank you. Can I? Yeah, please. <clears throat> I, I just want to further on, on sure. that question. So, you know, you just mentioned the budget, um, kind of you're inheriting a budget um, that's already been set and then we were in contract negotiations. So neither here or there, um, I'm familiar with what's going on in the department. Are you concerned with the budget that you, if you were be, to become the next fire chief, are you concerned with that budget? Is because that's I feel like that's what I'm hearing about overtime issues with the two, two new hires. And if that's the case, I, I think that we, the board, really need to grasp that so that sure. we're not running that deficit. And what kind of deficit are we are we doing? So yeah. I understand that the budget's pretty much level funded. We did a few things in there to change some things around, but if whether it be you or Mr. Fallon that's promoted, mm -hmm. if you look at that budget currently set that was presented to this board, 
which is pretty much a level out budget, right? Plus or minus a few dollars here and there. I, I got the budget book right here, it wasn't much. And y'all saying about the two new hires and, and some overtime costs. Whenever somebody mentions that in public safety, I know what we're looking at in, in the PD. It's extraordinary, right? And, we, yes. and, and overtime becomes a major problem for, for not only the department, um, for the well-being of the employees that are working exorbitant hours, um, but also the taxpayer. So I'm just, I'm concerned now. When you, and I understand that when I looked at the budget myself, I looked at it and I said, eh, you know, maybe we have to do something. So I think we're going to be discussing budgets later on. Yep. <coughs> yeah. So and I'm, thank you for asking that. I'll be, I'll be uh, more than happy, uh, able to, to kind of fill you in. Uh, really not a, a, a big concern. With any time where there's a labor agreement, whatever's agreed on, if there's a change in the current budget, uh, there's been no increase or, or, or decrease, whatever it may be, um, in, in that budget. Uh, but just aware that I'm aware that without having a uh, final agreement made, if there is any changes, then my proposal would be uh, to the town administration, you know, to move forward to try to see what we can do to be able to adjust that budget to meet those uh, compre that comprehensive look at that. If if there's any changes uh, throughout the agreement. Uh, so, so with with sorry, the overtime. Just, so what you're saying is not necessarily looking for more, but figure out how to work within you know, absolutely. the pot of money that you've been absolutely. allocating. Right, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So in, in, in the, the two uh, firefighters that are going to be, uh, firefighter paramedics or EFTs that are going to be coming on uh, full time, we, had, we do have a vacant slot right now, and then the position of hiring a fire chief is going to open up another spot, uh, another position within the department. And um, the in taking a look at the and I know because I said overtime, uh, I'm aware of the, the the deficit that's in this this year's uh, deficit uh, for overtime, and I'm aware of the the numbers for the fire department and the police department and the emergencies. So, I one of the things that uh, we can do to be able to address the overtime is uh, really take a look at um, how how we fill the overtime positions. Uh, historically, uh, contractually, uh, we've looked at, uh, and I'll just share this number, it's, it's, an, it's an average, typically, uh, when it comes time, we can't get rid of overtime, right? Because it's agreed, there's, there's agreements, there's labor agreements involved with that, people need vacations, or they get sick, or personal time. Um, but in filling the shifts, and filling those shifts, it's typically filled 60% full-time, and then 40%, uh, call firefighters or part-time paramedics and, and EMTs. Um, what we're looking at right now is some of the probably the lowest numbers um, in my career of the number of call firefighters that we have on the department right now. Um, I So looking at that to be able to get more call firefighters in to be able to fill some of that void so that we can take some of that extra stress off of the full-timers from, from having to work beyond the, that 60% or, or try to fill those voids that, that were vacant, uh, as well as um, the part-time uh, EMTs and paramedics. Uh, and within this past couple of years with the pandemic, it's been difficult because our structure uh, within that, within the department, we have two full-timers and then we have, we have one position that's a part-time, full 24 hours a day, and it's a part, held by a part-time uh, paramedic or an EMT. And they, most of them have full-time jobs somewhere else. They've had the, uh, the same demands on that we have in their own personal departments where they were forced to work a shift, where they'd have to drop a shift that they were scheduled for. And at that point, we, it, the, the, it would go back to, to uh, we try to fill that shift, be able to make sure that the town is covered. And um, in, in the end, there was a a reduced number of available part-time personnel to be able to fill that shift so that the full-timers would have to circle back and fill it. So that's kind of a little bit of the inflation in, in, in our overtime. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll, we'll look at if we hire more uh, EMTs and paramedics part-time, there's no cost to the town to be able to hire them because they get paid for when they do when they do the work. There's no benefit package because it's a part-time right. em employee. So right. I didn't want to, to scare you away with that. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that I'm aware of it. We're going to work some 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 solutions to be able to minimize any uh, additional costs. Mr. We're, we are coming up upon the uh, allocated time sure. for each candidate. Mr. Uh, DeRoche, do you have anything that you, I know you 
dealing with some laryngitis. Is there anything you want to comment on before we give Mr. Arruda the opportunity for a closing statement? Well, at this time, I'm all set. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Arruda, if you just give us a brief 30 second closing statement. Sure. Um, you bet. Um, again, thank you, uh, gentlemen, for the opportunity to, to be up here in front of you. Um, I, can, I can be certain that either myself or the other candidate uh, here in front of you today uh, would be a fantastic choice for the town, uh, for the chief. I'd be proud to work for the other candidate. I'd be honored to be your fire chief and to, to, build, and to develop and build a, a professional relationship with, with you in the, in the town. So I appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Ruder. Thank, Thank you. you. If you wouldn't mind, you know, if you just hang out in the selectman's office, and then when Mr. Defilean is done, we'll just do one last closing statement, um, you bet. and then let you know what the next steps right. are. And I uh, appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Let's see, so he had 20, He had about 24 minutes. Just to make it fair. Following. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you, sir? How are you? I'm okay. Mr. Great. Moen is going to let you know what your time limit is now that you were able to go second. The first candidate set the time frame. Right. So the uh, first candidate spoke for roughly 24 minutes. So in the interest of fairness, you've got the uh, about 24 minutes to uh, make a case. We've got four questions that we have uh, pre-selected sure. that we will ask you. Um, and then you know, we want this to be kind of a conversation. And, uh, Again, as I mentioned earlier, I really want to thank you uh, for putting yourself through this process and putting yourself out here. Uh, it's not an easy task. Uh, we have to do it every three years where all your credentials are out before the public and uh, people have to decide uh, whether they like you or not. And I know that's not a, an easy thing to go through. So uh, thank you very much for doing that. Um, if you would just briefly tell us who you are um, and then we'll get into the, the, the questioning. Okay. Uh, well, but like, just, you know, name, how long you've been with the department, sure. so on and so forth, then I'll ask for a little bit more detail. All right. Uh, my name is Thomas Farland. Uh, I've been with the town for 22 years. Um, the first six of which I spent at EMS when it was a third service. Um, and in 2000, February of 2006, I joined the fire department under Chief Gallagher, um, and I have been there ever since as a firefighter paramedic. Great. Thank you. All right. Uh, tell us... Uh, give us some work experience, a general overview of yourself. Tell us what interested you in applying for the fire chief position. In your overview, please discuss your education, your training, and experience. Sure. So expound on sort of how you've teed it up for us this morning. Sure. Um, so as I said, I've, I've been with the town for 22 years, um, initially as an EMT, then as a paramedic, and then as a firefighter paramedic. Um, I, I view it as um, a calling, uh, really. And I have attempted to do everything in my power, not just to put me in a position um, for this moment when Chief Gallagher retired, but just to be the best possible um, employee, uh, first responder that I could be. Um, I enjoy all kinds of education. Um, I take as many classes as the Fire Academy will let me. I have several certifications, as you um, gentlemen have been able to see in, in my resume. Um, on the medical side, I do as much as I can to learn all of the new techniques, the changes. Um, it changes more than the fire side does, the medical side, the, the EMS side. Um, every year we go through protocol revisions and updates. Um, and on top of that, there's other certifications and classes that we can take um, to better prepare ourselves for when the call comes. Um, on top of that, I've also had a personal drive for my own personal benefit um, to learn as much as I can about the different things that we do on the side, on our job, um, but also to be able to help whoever is around me. Um, and that includes um, going back to college. Um, when I was younger, um, when I first started, uh, I attended UMass Dartmouth and I uh, left there with a bachelor's in biology pre-med. Um, after a, quite a break in that type of education, while I was invested in fire academy classes and the EMS con ed. I then went back uh, and obtained my associates in fire science from uh, Bristol Community College and went on further to obtain a bachelor's 
and Fire Protection Administration from Eastern Kentucky University. Um, I view all of that as part of being a firefighter paramedic in today's world. It's no longer just about you got to find where the fire is and put water on it. Um, there are so many tactics that are changing. It's about where where do you put a hole in the roof to, so that you protect the part of the house that's unburned. So there's a lot of science that goes into it, and I absolutely enjoy science and math. So it's been a hand-in-hand -hand, uh, experience to get that education and be able to relate it to the job. Yeah. What has been your greatest challenge and greatest success as a member of the fire EMS department? Uh, the greatest success is a little easier uh, for me. I've had several. Uh, the two that stand out in my mind, um, one early on prior to joining the fire department when I was working for EMS, um, I was able to um, become one of the first three paramedics for the town of Akushnet when we started our advanced life support system after St. Luke's had disbanded their paramedic program. Um, so being able to be one of the first three to allow Akushnet to develop and move into that next level that we needed to move into uh, is something that sticks out in my mind. On the fire side, um, we're going back about nine or 10 years now um, and we had an incident in the middle of the night uh, where we had a house fire um, and myself along with a couple of my colleagues uh, were able to um, rescue a victim from the house fire um, and get her to the hospital in a timely manner in which she was able to survive and, and go on further. Uh, challenges. I, that one's a little more difficult. Every day is a challenge. Because when you walk in the door, you don't know what you're going to have that day. Um, it could be a fire call. As I said, with the with the history there that we've had that, that successful rescue. It could be something like we've had in the past where the whole house is gone. We were able to keep the family safe, but we ended up losing a whole structure. And it could be something as a really bad emergency call uh, on the ambulance side. With, with it, It's a challenge because medicals, we don't really know what the, it, a fire you can say, yep, that's a fire. On the, on the ambulance, you have to play detective. Um, so many of those can be challenging. Um, but every day is a challenge in its own way. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so you kind of uh, alluded on it. If you just walk us through a uh, challenging crisis that occurred in your work experience step by step, include the actions taken, failure, success, what you learned from the event, you know, sure. so one signature thing that stuck out for you. Um, so this would be in reference to that rescue that, um, that our department made several years ago. Um, as you gentlemen know, we operate very uniquely on the fire side. So when I arrive at a, a house fire, fortunately for us, it was close to the station. Um, unfortunately for me, that meant I arrived alone for the first about 60 seconds. Um, so I was able to gain access into the house. And by that point, I was able to have a couple of uh, my colleagues right there with me that lived in the, in the neighborhood. Um, and together we were able to um, advance the hose line into the building, get water, close to the fire and create a safe evacuation area for um, getting the victim out onto, in, onto the ambulance stretcher and then they were able to take care of her from there. Um, it went well in that we were able to rescue her. Um, there were several challenges. Her location um, was on the second floor and in order to reach the victim, um, we had to go by the room that was on fire. Um, so that presented a challenge. Later on, after everything was kind of settling down and we were able to kind of do an after action report, uh, we noticed there was a window in the room that, that we located the victim in that we may have been able to put a ladder to and get her out um, a little easier than, than the way we did, but ultimately it worked out in the, the best. Yeah. If promoted to chief, what would you do in your first 100 days? In the fire service, and I'm sure in, in your careers as selectmen, 100 days seems like a lot, but it's not a lot. Everything takes time. We have several projects that Chief Gallagher has started that will be continuing. Um, my goal for the first 100 days is to be able to continue on where he left off, 
with those with those but begin to look further into the future um, we have a lot of good employees that we currently have and the most important part of my first hundred days is going to be able is going to be getting in touch with all of them and just relaying where we want to go for the future what my expectations of them are and how I plan to operate I might not be identical to Chief Gallagher I don't think any two people could be um, especially with Chief Gallagher he's done so much for this community um, my goal is to just tell them what they can expect of me and let them know what my expectations are of them and to continue to keep the, the wheels moving in the direction and not cause any stumbling blocks. Thank you. Um, you know, in our last, so we, we kind of touched on budget. Mm -hmm. So maybe just give us a view of, kind of going off script, but you know, your view of the budget and how you would uh, deal with what you're dealing with now or, you know, so on and so forth. So, so budgets can be tough. Um, and just like with our own personal budgets, we want to do so much, but we're restricted by our budgets. And that's the same with a department as it is in your personal life. You may want to go to Hawaii, but your bank account's telling you no. But we may want to buy a brand new Cadillac fire engine, but the budget says whoa. So the, the, the aspect of that is to work with in the means that we have, knowing we have you know, EMS reserve receipt account that brings in money um, and knowing that, you know, we're fortunate in how we operate where the town is good to us, both you gentlemen and the, the townspeople at town meeting. Um, and we need to look at what our needs are and prioritize where the spending needs to happen to get the biggest bang for our buck and make the most impact for the least amount of money so that we can continue to help the town's people on the fire side, but also help their wallets on the back side as well. Can you ask for anything you want to uh, touch on in that regard? <coughs> now, um, Mr. Uh, Aruda brought up some concerns about looking at the budget, and that's what spurred my sure. question off of the regular sure. questions about should we be pumping the brakes? We're going to be discussing budgets today. Sure. And, you know, you mentioned some overtime because there were two new firefighters, and that always is a as you know, my background is finance. Um, I'm always concerned about the available funds that we have for budgeting. Absolutely. Um, we're going to get into some of that dialogue later on. Um, I, I know it's, you know, everybody has needs, as you both mentioned, and other departments have needs. And, and, and like Sarah Gomes is here from the school department, everybody has needs, but we only have so much money to fulfill those needs on top of all of our fixed costs. And again, the union agreements, contracts, negotiations, things of the like. So, you know, I heard that my antennas went up. You know, if we need to trim, we can trim some right. in some other places. If we need to allocate a little bit into different budgets, um, you know, you're going to take from Peter and pay Paul. Yep. If that's what it takes, that's the decisions that this board would ultimately make. Um, ultimately, they are our departments, right? Correct. Um, and, and we try to do our best to work with the department head to figure out if you know if the needs are real mm -hmm. um, or it's just something that they would like right um, and, and what's the necessity of that need versus can it wait another year and let's figure it out right um, so it's just again there's only so much money to go around um, and I know there's been some discussion with Mr. Kelly over available funds and, and estimating revenues lower than what they are and everything else. But you know you can't just say, well, this is what what you're collecting, and next year you right. have the same amount. You don't, right. especially when it comes to excise tax. I'll do more on that later. I've already done that conversation in my previous meeting. Um, so I just didn't know if you looked at the budget because I know the chief had put it forward. I know it's a pretty level funded budget for a department fire EMS. I try to, and I have for several years, um, watch as many meetings as I can. I am a town resident, um, like Mr. Aruda. Um, and part of what we like to keep is we like to keep ourselves as informed as possible. And for the last 
two or three years on top of just that own personal kind of interest in how the town's doing and how our department is doing chief gallagher has been slowly bringing us in and kind of shaping us knowing that as the two senior members of the department we were most likely going to be part of the future and um budgets are always a challenge um just like with my home budget if i could have unlimited funds awesome same thing with the department. if we could have unlimited funds hey throw a party that's not the reality so the reality is we got to look at what we have internally in our budget and the available funds and see what what fits and what doesn't um, that's always going to be the challenge um, today five years from now ten years from now 100 years from now we're only limited by that we we have a lot of very talented people on our staff Korea part-time EMS employees and call firefighters and they've done some amazing things with the, the limited budget and we've gotten creative and we've done a lot of good things and I don't see that changing anytime soon um, would we like to have more money in the budget I'm sure all of us would I'm sure each department head would as well um, it's just a matter of being able to take what is there um, and figuring out how to best use it and make it work without going backwards Great. Thank you. Uh, so, Tom, if you want to give us a brief 30 second, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. DeRoche, uh, I apologize. Do um, you have anything that you want to say or uh, question? <clears throat> well, um, I had no question the first time, so um, it would probably be unfair if I asked one at this time, or would we have to bring in the other candidate to answer, answer it? <clears throat> It's up to you, it's Dave. On that. It, it's, uh, I think, in fairness to both candidates, you know, if you've got something that you want to introduce, in fairness to both candidates, I would ask that we give the other candidate. Well, I just had a general overall question um, in the sense of uh, what, is, what do the, the uh, candidates consider the roles of a fire chief, you know, in general, as a, as a, manager, as, as a management role? Okay, Mr. Farland, you heard that? Um, so as, as management, in my opinion, the role of the fire chief is many-sided. Um, so obviously it's the overall day-to-day -day operation of the department that you're responsible for. Um, you're also responsible to the Board of Selectmen, uh, the town administrator with respect to um, the budget and all of the duties that lie within there. Um, but more so, I think the, the responsibility is more to the employees and to the citizens of the town. Um, as management, yes, we're supposed to lead, but how we lead is the telling, telltale sign of a good manager. A good manager is going to want to make sure that every single one of his employees succeeds. They're going to encourage. They're going to hold accountable, which is not something that gets done a lot in today's society. We have to hold each other accountable. And I would argue that it's just as important for me to expect my employees to keep me accountable for the things that I say and the actions that I take. Um, I, I would hope that that is the case. Um, that is one of the most important. We can't have a successful fire department with just a good leader. You need to have a good crew. And the way to have that crew is to encourage growth, encourage improvement, and hold everybody to the expectations. And the expectations need to be the same for everybody. Mr. Rose, is that? All right, thank you. All right, Mr. Farland, you got a 30 second right. closing statement. And Lisa, um, if you could maybe go let Eric know. We've got one more question, then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, I just want to thank Chief Gallagher, you gentlemen on the Board of Selectmen, Mr. Kelly, um, for the opportunity uh, that we have in front of us today. Um, there are many departments throughout the country where an internal candidate is not necessarily looked at. And your commitment, Chief Gallagher's commitment to mentor Mr. Arruda, myself, um, and to look internal at the qualified candidates that we have, um, I just wanna extend my appreciation of that. Um, right. No matter the outcome, this department is in really good hands for the next 10, 15 years. Right, thank you, Mr. Fox. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Arruda? Yeah, 
Thank you, Mr. Ruda. How are you? Um, so Mr. Garosh came in came in off the top rope <laughs> in the last minute with a last minute question. So if you want to, uh, in the interest of fairness, we want to give you the same Great, opportunity. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Garosh. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lona. Um, Mr. Ruda, this is a generalization question, or a general question, I should say. What do you consider the roles of the fire chief in this town? Sure, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the roles of uh, the fire chief is to uh, perform day-to-day -day operations uh, for the fire department. That's administrative roles, management roles. Um, and the, um, the uh, ma managing the budget of the fire department uh, the personnel uh, and uh, getting a handle on uh, definitely definitely the budget the personnel uh, and like I said just the day-to-day -day operations of uh, being a leader being a, a, a figurehead uh, for the for that department uh, in uh, being uh, responsible for uh, the department but responsible to the Board of Selectmen uh, responsible to the community and to the members of of the fire department themselves thank you all right. Very good. Thank you very much. Thanks. Did you just grab uh, Mr. Farlin? Sure. Sorry for all the back and forth. No, we'll that's not sure. <laughs> sure. Just we'll just do a final uh, closing statement to the board. All right, Mr. Farlin, uh, Mr. Ruda, again, on behalf of the board, thank you uh, to you and your family for uh, your families for uh, supporting you and, and you. Uh, taking this uh, process very, very seriously. Um, you have provided some really compelling uh, information. Um, as a personal note, it's, it's a real source of pride for me because I've watched your careers from the very beginning to this point over the last two decades or so. And so um, this, is, this is the fun part of the job, really. I mean, this is why I think we all run for office, is to be in a position to make a decision uh, like this, so thank you very much again uh, for putting yourself forward, um, Mr. Gasper, uh, Mr. Roche. Any other closing comments on your part, and then we'll tell you a little bit about what the next steps may be. No, no, I'm select my one. I, I I know that you gentlemen did some ready uh, written questions and presented the board with your response to those written questions. Um, both done a great job with it. Um, I actually went through both of them, and I kind of like I did today. I ranked the answers. Um, we kind of scored it out. Um, I think you both did a good job um, answering those questions. It was very informative to get and digest what y'all looking at and get inside of your head. It's basically what you allowed me to do when I read through it. Is I, I got to get inside of each one of your heads to see that vision. Um, and I think that's what you did. You both demonstrated a vision. Um, so, you know, no matter what, we you both you both said it to this board no matter what decision is made we know we're going to make a good decision and i think that's the key for both of you two young men um, and as mr wona said i've been fortunate enough to uh work with both of you gentlemen for quite some time not only on finance committee but also on, on the board of selectmen for, for quite some time now um and it's been a pleasure working with both of you and it's always and it's been a pleasure to watch um, how you conduct yourself when you're on duty. Um, I think that's important. I always got my eyes on you guys, whether you know it or not. Um, okay. I take a peek at every once in a while, and, and, and the commitment from you two gentlemen to this community, um, forget about to this board, to the community, and that's what really matters, right? That's why we're all here, is the commitment to our community um, is outstanding from both of you gentlemen. So I thank you very much for your commitment to the community. I think that's up the utmost important thing um, that you, you two gentlemen have demonstrated your commitment. It's, just, it's unbelievable, so thank you very much for thank that you. commitment. Thank you. Mr. DeRoche? Yeah. Yes. Yes, Mr. Warner, I would like to relay to both candidates my appreciation for their pursuit of this position. I consider both extremely qualified, and my hope is that this transition maintains the quality and integrity this department has grown to have. Thank you. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thank um, you. Through the town administrator, you know, we relayed um, that because this is such an important decision, there's so much content, so much information. Me personally, I'd like to uh, 
go back to the tape and review the interviews and really put the time and energy uh, behind making my vote. And I know I think the board has communicated the same to Mr. Kelly and Mr. DeRoche has indicated because he couldn't be here personally that we'd like to defer this decision until Tuesday, uh, okay. which is our next regu regu yeah, regularly scheduled Board of Selectmen meeting. So with that, um, thank you very much. I would ask that you guys come up. Let's take a photo together. Please. Um, I think, again, we're all in together. And it's an important day. This interview process is <coughs> just as important as the appointment itself. Thank you. Thanks, man. Thanks for coming. No problem, my friend. Yeah, yeah, you two gentlemen in here, shake yeah. hands, and then we'll be on the, uh, <laughs> we'll be on the flight. <laughs> Today on the flight. Great. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, thank you gentlemen. And, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, uh, gentlemen, we do have other things on our agenda I would just ask that before we go into the budget I do have a uh, I, I do ask if we just take a brief recess um, because I have a personal uh, item that I've got to address um, make a phone call on I apologize but there are two new business things I think we can get through pretty quickly um, and then we'll when I come back it should be about 10 15 minutes we can get into the uh, the other stuff, but that's okay, gentlemen. I apologize, um, but I misread the, uh, the schedule. So with that, we've got a reserve fund transfer for a police electronic fingerprint machine for the total of $9,093.10. This was a CARES Act proposal um, that was not funded, and it was a commitment that we had made a while ago. Is there a motion to approve? Mr. I'm sorry. Mr. Warner, yes. the reserve fund transfer, um, it says 9000 but on the, on, the, on the board it says for various speed zones on the reserve fund transfer. So oh, I know the, sheet. Yeah, the agenda says, and I believe this is the real purpose for a fingerprint machine because yes. I believe the chief came in under the CARES Act, yeah. but that kind of got missing. Uh, into the input there, but on the on the bottom of the sheet. So I would just ask Mr. Kelly to correct the sheet if if we are correct and the agenda is correct, yeah. um, change it so it doesn't look because this was the previous one that we actually did the yeah. purchase of solar power signs for various speed zones doesn't match up with the agenda. Yeah. So I would ask Mr. Kelly to make that correction to the request for transfer from the reserve fund before going to FinCon tonight. You may, uh, that'll be a, a motion or a friendly amendment. Mr. Gaskin and, and, uh, and I, would, the, uh, I believe Mr. Fund. DeRoche, Chairman DeRoche, made a motion to approve. Is that correct? That is correct. And I'll second. Right. And I'll that second is. that motion. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Motion passes. Lastly, Aye. A historical commission for a bench for a historical property in town. Um, I guess it's a reserve fund transfer again. Um, I don't know what to say about it other than. I don't know if the, we could have done this through CPC, but it sounds like there's an immediate need that needs to be resolved. Um, but I would just ask in the future these types of things get vetted with the town administrator um, in the board. This was a uh, issue that the purchase was made. The historical commission thought it was uh, not a purchase, but a donation. Huh. And it turned out that it was a purchase, and it uh, uh, there was no budget line uh, available to fund it. And the, the town, you uh, have town officials that have, I've discussed it with them. They know not to do this again. Right. It's a uh, something that I assume in the. Uh, when it was ordered, it was in the interregnum between when I arrived and when uh, others uh, were leaving. And so it's something that shouldn't be done, but uh, again. Okay. Mr. Wona, it sounds like to me like uh, we have no choice really. Right. Right. This, this, is, this is a situation where the Historical Commission thought it was a donation and they got a bill for it. The bench has been made. And installed. Follow and installed, so I'll make a motion to approve. I'll, uh, Mr. I'll second. I'll second that motion. 
Motion pass. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Motion passes. Aye. All right, last one under new business is, uh, as you know, we need a, a, an interim town moderator. Um, and there is an election coming up, but town meeting is May 9th. Fortunately, we have two candidates who have uh, come forward, uh, Mr. Mike Garnett, Garnett and Mr. Les Dakin, um, both excellent candidates. Gentlemen, I don't know how you feel, but um, Mr. Dakin has served in some uh, pretty important positions in town, understands town meeting, understands uh, how things operate, the warrant, so on and so forth, as a former selectman and, the, and an assessor. And you know, that's that the board endorsed Mr. Uh, Dakin's uh, candidacy for uh, to serve as town moderator. Mr. Warner, Mr. I would, Warner, I would, Mr. Chairman, uh, with with Mr. Uh, Dakin's past experience as a selectman and town commissioner, and his experience in town meetings. Um, for this uh, appointment, which would be for uh, this fall town or the spring town meeting, I would uh, I would put forward his name. Thank you. Is that a motion That's to nice appoint Mr. DeRoche? What's, excuse me? Is that a motion to appoint Mr. Dakin as a town moderator for the May 9th town meeting, if that's May 9th? Yes, please. Yes. I'll second that motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And I would encourage Mr. Garnett, if he's uh, really interested in being town moderator longer term, um, if they can do a write-in campaign or, or perhaps next year they can be on the ballot. All right. Okay. Very good. Uh, gentlemen, as I mentioned before, I do have a, a, a personal item that I have to uh, attend to. Shouldn't take more than 10, 15 minutes, hopefully. Uh, can I have a motion to uh, have a brief recess? So moved. Second, second, the second, and we will reconvene. Thank you. All right, thank you uh, for that opportunity to recess. Uh, we'd like to, I uh, need a motion to uh, come out of recess and reconvene into regular session. So moved. I'll Rush. second that. All those in favor? Aye. All right, motion passes. Aye. We've got uh, budget discussions. Turn that over to the town administrator. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as you know, at your next meeting, the board has to vote to close the warrant. Uh, we are still waiting for DOR to certify our free cash. Uh, target number is uh, approximately a million and a half. But I'm not going to be able to put actual numbers to the warrant articles concerning capital expenses or stabilization funds until we get a certified number. So that should be for the next meeting. But as soon as I do, I will forward under separate copy what we have. Uh, I also, at the direction of the board, decreased the revenue estimates by 150000 for the excise tax, uh, and I had a meeting with uh, the superintendent of schools and the business manager, and then a subsequent meeting with the school committee's budget subcommittee to inform them of that fact and ask that they consider any possible cuts from the school budget between fifty and seventy-five thousand dollars. We had a discussion. I explained how uh, the uh, revenue estimates have uh, are just estimates, and we wanted to make sure that when we passed the budget. It was not an out-of-balance budget. It's my duty to present a balanced budget to the town meeting or to show the town meeting uh, a budget that is out of balance and what the town meeting would have to do to put it into balance. The town meeting must pass a balanced budget. Uh, I have talked to the board and uh, 
on various items and I've presented to the board recommendations of items that we could cut to the amount of 74000 and change. Uh, that nothing's defi definite because we have to have the uh, board's input. Uh, it's getting to the point since uh, this budget uh, is, I've got to verify every single figure that between now and next meeting, I will be going over to see the records of the past budgets and uh, making sure that the actual budget that's presented to you is accurate figures. Uh, I am waiting for the school department to get back to me. Uh, uh, they have a number of meetings scheduled between now before your uh, meeting on the 12th because I would not like to go to town meeting with a budget that needs to be changed on the floor. That's correct. Uh, Ms. Gomes, from the, I know we mentioned a lot of school <coughs> related stuff. I want to give you an opportunity if there's anything you want to say uh, or not. Um, no, not at this time, but we do have a subcommittee meeting on Friday Great. to discuss our next steps. Um, Mrs. Roche, anything you want to offer? Yeah, you're on mute. I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, uh, Wona, I missed that last uh, statement. No, it was just if there's anything that you want to offer or say. Um, on yeah, on but prior question. to that, what was said? No, I just offered Ms. Uh, Gomes from the school department, from the school committee, an opportunity to, to say something, to speak, uh, based on Mr. Kelly's uh, representation that we've had a, a dialogue, an ongoing dialogue with the school department in uh, with the hopes of uh, some, some trimming. Well, uh, I would just like to mention that um, the request that we're making is, uh, uh, you know, to put it on the record, we're asking for a, a compromise here of, of about a fourth of 1%. I was at the uh, school meeting um, that was held with the Finance Committee, and um, uh, at least as, as uh, this member of the Board of Select, but I'm not looking to start cutting curriculum or to start cutting uh, the needs that the school has that I heard of the school nurse or the, or the uh, library uh, specialist that, that the school is requesting to hire. What I am looking, you know, hoping that we can accomplish is that, uh, you know, we can uh, trim that, that's 75, 50,000 as requested by Mr. Kelly from uh, other parts of the budget that, um, that could be considered. That, that's all I have to say about that. And uh, I'd be open to continuing this conversation with the school committee to try to come to a balanced budget by town meeting. Thank you. Mr. <clears throat> Gasper? I would, I would just ask, um, I know we got other business on the table, um, Mr. Wonow, but I would ask Mr. Kelly, we have to go to print with a warrant in the budget. You have to vote to close and approve the warrant at your next meeting on the 12th. That includes all of our budgets because FinCom is going to meet the Wednesday after and that's it. So would, would it be prudent to say that maybe we should not have any further discussions on the new spreadsheets that we got for the budgets um, and concerns for today and we'll do that on Tuesday? I would say I, uh, you folks have some recommendations that I put before you. It's all fluid. If you, I would appreciate any input individually from the members. If there's something that you consider uh, uh, I shouldn't do, uh, please let me know. If there's something you consider I should look at, please let me know. Well, the board the board has some options. We kept several budgets open, not many, but several budget uh, bigger budgets, right? Open. Um, I'm getting to look at some of these things that Mr. And Kelly you can, did. You can reconsider others. We, we can we can reconsider others, and I, I would just want to I just want to mention to uh, the chairman and, and Mr. Wong of the board 
that we have to have a dialogue with uh, DPW because we did get notification from the city of New Bedford with increased rates in sewer and increased rates in water. Um, and I don't believe that these budgets will cover that increase. Um, so That's separate <coughs> from the operating That's budget. correct, it's separated from the operating budgets, but it is two budgets that we need to have them in at our next meeting, because there may be adjustments to these, and you, as every, everybody should be aware of, you can't deficit spend in an enterprise fund. So um, we have to make sure that there's appropriate funding in our enterprise funds to cover the budget, and I know that the budgets will be impacted, especially sewer, so we'll have to do a rate adjustment. Unfortunately, we'll have that dialogue with um, Mr. Minot and Ms. Silva next week. I just wanted some clarifications. I, 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 we talked about that excise tax, and, and there was a discussion with Mr. Kelly, I guess, from the school and the FinCom, and everybody's concerned about using more realistic revenue numbers and the one target number that's um, been out there is excise tax. Um, I, I talked a little bit about that last time and being very uncomfortable using what our collections were, 1.672, and we were about to budget 1.6. It's unrealistic because it's a sliding six-year scale. Um, everybody needs to understand there's only so much money to go around, and that money that's going around is a prop two and a half levy increase that we're able to go, which is about $500,000, and then our new growth, which fluctuates every year, um, and we should be using more of a three to five year running average of new growth because you've seen a couple of years ago we had a big spike in new growth. It was like 734,000. This year we got 400,000. So we went and budgeted with 700 last year, but we only collected 400 in, in new growth this year. The math just doesn't work, right? You can't just use that. You need a three year average, a five year average of new growth. Say this is what it is based on an assumption. I know everybody wants more realistic numbers, but it's a moving target every year. We don't know what that number is, just like excise is. So using the numbers that are really knowns, that's what we need to use. Um, I, I know that the school department's a big percentage of the overall town's budget, so we would expect them to need more money. Um, but um, according to my math, um, the budget's up $457,000 this year, right? That's almost all of our Prop 2 and a half levy increase, okay? That's all of our Prop 2 and a half levy increase minus like 45,000 bucks left over and then a new growth. But then we have all the fixed costs. What I want to... I want to give a little alarm to everybody that thinks all this money's floating around. I don't know if I made the comment strong enough last time, is the school department's budget has, I would assume, some union negotiations with built inside of that budget number. Our budgets from our side does not have one negotiation, not one, contract obligations. We haven't ratified one contract, okay? So if we're going to use that money, okay, and we're going to say this is what it all is, we're way overspending this year because from the town's perspective, from the town side of the operation, to ratify all the union contracts, depending on that percentage, and I'm going to give a narrow range, but I won't throw a number out, it's going to be 200 to two and a quarter, roughly, to negotiate all of the contracts that are open right now. So theoretically, we've already pulled in $110,000 of excess levy capacity that we shelved last year or the year before. Mr. Kelly's pulling that off. That's arbitrary money. It's like free cash. And we're already using that to set this year's budget. We'd be in deficit by a half a million dollars if we didn't have this little phony money running around right now is what I'm trying to tell everybody. So we're working towards a common goal, trying to figure out what revenues, and I'll be the first to admit, I think that the town, the town accountant and the town administrator in previous years have used underestimated revenues. And we're trying to now get to a more realistic revenue projections that we're doing. We're in the process of doing that. But I'd be damned if, if anybody and everybody is just going to come running for the gates for the money, thinking that that's available revenue when it's really not. Okay, and we're going to spend it all this year. What are we going to do next year? It's going to collapse is what it's going to do. So I think we all need to just come together, realize the facts of what we have for money, and work within our means to try to meet that goal. And I think that we can do that. We've given... I think the Board of Selectmen have given an endorsement. We talked about a $300,000. That's what the projected number that everybody's floating in an excise tax. It's not a realistic number, okay? It's not that high is what I'm telling you. So we're going to say, if we're going to raise that bar and we're going to add another 150000 in, okay, I might be comfortable with that number. I could be wrong. We could be overinflating that number again. But if that's the number that everybody wants to use, let's use it. But there's not $1.3, $1.5 million of revenue that you can be using every year and everybody's going to get what they want is the moral of the story. So we need to be more realistic with what we do in our budget process. 
Um, I, I think next year is going to be a very challenging year. This one's a challenging year. We're going to make some cuts to our budgets. Um, the school, hopefully, they can they can do something. If not, we, we need to do more on our side. Uh, I know there's a couple of requests in, in one of the budgets. I won't name it right now. We'll have that conversation um, off scenes with Mr. Kelly. But we need to go to town meeting with a balanced budget. Don't I, I would hope that not everybody understands, and including the, the taxpayers and the residents of this community, the last thing we want to do is go to town meeting with an unbalanced budget and we end up with a World War III on town meeting floor. That's not going to bode well for any of our taxpayers, right? It's not in the best interest of this community. That's our jobs. The Finance Committee, the Town Administrator, the Board of Select, and the School Committee, all the department heads, to figure it out amongst ourselves, saying this is how much money we have, this is how we're going to get there, and we go to town meeting with a balanced budget, and it gets voted. Enough of the getting to town meeting and rating stabilization, or saying we're going to raid, use free cash to balance a budget. It's a no-no. The DOR says do not use free cash to balance a budget. So everybody needs to get free cash out of the head. Yes, it's a big number. That's for capital items only. So we need to get to a better place amongst ourselves. FinCom, Board of Selectmen, School Committee, Department Heads, Public Safety, everybody needs to come together and say, we only have a small pool of money. I'm going to be honest with you, and I'll be honest to all of our taxpayers out there right now, if, if we were to no negotiate union contracts, we don't have any money, okay? We're basically broke is what I'm going to tell you this year right now, mark my words. You don't have the money to do it. If you do the increase, and you do if we ratified union contracts on the town side with all of our fixed costs, we're above the $800,000 number already. So where do we go from here? I might as well say it right now, today, because next year we're going to be sitting at this table having this discussion, and there ain't going to be enough money. Because you can't use free cash to balance a budget. End of story. So everybody says, well, you got $1.6 million in free cash. Look, we can get all the raises we want. We can, we can expand our budgets all you want. No, you can't. The DOI does not want us to use free cash. Is that correct, Mr. Kelly? That's correct. So let, let's let's all try to do a better job. We're going to bring revenues more in line with what we really have. We're going to work towards that goal, whether it be the town side, school side. We're all going to do our fair share to intermingle, get the communications out there, try to do a better job of working together so that when we show up on town meeting floor, we have a balanced budget that meets everyone's needs as best as we can with the money that we have available to do it. That's all Thank I you, have. Mr. Gassman. Mr. Chairman, just so the board knows, I've had discussions with uh, the management of the DPW, and it doesn't look like there needs to be an adjustment to the water enterprise at this point. There does look that there needs to be an adjustment in the sewer rate, in the sewer budget. And uh, we're looking at approximately 50,000 there. Uh, as far as uh, anything else, uh, what Mr. Gasper said about free cash is true. And you have mm -hmm. a, a number of areas that DOR wants to see free cash used for. One of them is your OPEB liability, the other is your capital items, and you've got a multi-million dollar OPEB liability and you're at, uh, if we're lucky with free cash this year, you might get close to a million dollars in the trust fund. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, your revenue, it's your operating budget. You can't use free cash for it. So, so sorry, I know we, we didn't want to put you on the hot seat here, right? And no. so, so, but thank you for, for taking the time. I think I just ask that you communicate back to your colleagues is that the Board of Selectmen, we're not here to like, you know, point fingers or nitpick about budgets. Um, if there's ever a time to honor the process, the budgetary process, it's now during a fiscal crisis. Um, when things are really good, then you can deviate a little bit here and there. But now's the time to be overly disciplined. Um, and I would just say that I think this board um, has been supportive of the schools. You know, and when it, with the roof, whether it was came to the school roof, because of the foresight we had on solar, solar funds, which is a deep, you know, depreciating asset, we were able to pay for that school roof without going to the voter. 
and you didn't have to expend political capital on a roof, right? And so um, all we'd ask is, you know, we're not asking of the school department anything more than we're asking of ourselves. Um, and so you guys have always been, always <laughs> delivered on that part and ask that you continue to do that. So, um, you know, that, that's, that's the message. Okay, I will absolutely do that. Can I just say two of things? Of course, yeah, please. So, you know, being part of the school committee for the past six years, it seems that, and I'm talking personally, not as, I, I don't want to talk as a subcommittee um, chair, um, that our town is never in a fiscal good position. It's true. Every year. 100%. And so even with the ups and downs of our economies, you know, I'm a mortgage banker, I understand how it goes. Um, it seems like every year we're fighting just to balance the budget. So I know it was just mentioned that, you know, in these critical times, well, last year was a critical time, the year before that was a critical time, and come to find out in the fall, we did have the money to fund the things that we needed to. But you asked, and I'm, now I'm talking just about the school committee, you asked us to keep cutting. But then in the fall, we find out that there is money. However, with the school department, I, I don't want to say we're special, but there is a reality that we have as a school district mm -hmm. that we cannot go back in the fall and ask for funds like other departments can in our town. So I just want to make that aware to our selectmen that literally this year we knew, you know, that it was a critical time again and we completely understand that that's how this town works. That we cut every possible thing that we could, hours upon hours. and. Um, Dave, we, we said that, right, in our meeting with FinCom, like we cut everything that we possibly could to the point where if we cut anything less, you know, we would start taking away important things that we need for the, excuse me, of the goals of the school. So with that said, um, and, and uh, Mr. Kelly said that 3% was very reasonable, and, and we cut, we had over 6.5%, and we cut it down to 3 just to be completely realistic with, with our town and being thoughtful of what you know, our, our community needs. At the same time, again, keeping our goals. So with this 3%, you know, we thought we did our due diligence. We really did. Um, and again, the two meetings that we had with Mr. Kelly and with FinCom, 3% was considered reasonable. Then we find out next week that we need an additional 75,000, which just happens to be one of the new positions that we really need for the elementary school, right? Well, we can't get rid of that. We need that. We, the, the elementary school needs a librarian, needs a media specialist. We, we really need this. So it's what might possibly happen, and again, I, I, I can't say for sure since our budget meeting is not until Friday, but the only way to fix this without eliminating something or, or removing something that is truly important is to prepay tuitions for the following year, which rule of thumb, and Mr. Kelly, correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, is we shouldn't be doing that. That's kind of like using our free cash, if you would, if you may. Um, so that's the only thing that we can think of that would help you balance the budget. So again, you know, we're, we're trying to be thoughtful, but at the same time, I personally don't want to hear that we cut this or prepaid, budget, we prepaid tuition and then find out in the fall we have another 600000 that we could have spent Right, but we can't now, right? Unless there's some agreement, and I don't know if this is even possible, to get back that prepaid tuition that we paid for our budget. So we're not creating a deficit moving forward in our budget for the following year. So again, I'd just like to put that out there to the public, like we are really trying to, and um, Kristen Flynn and, and Dr. Bailey, uh, myself and Jennifer Downing, hours upon hours trying to cut as much as we possibly could for, for our community. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, keeping the goals of, I mean, we have 37 new houses being built in our town. They're all three bedroom, two bath at least. Families are going to be spending 600 plus thousand dollars to, to buy these homes. They're gonna look at our school system. We cannot ignore the school. And 3%, in my opinion, and in my colleagues' opinions, is very reasonable. So I'll leave it at that. Totally. We, we all we don't disagree with the priorities. You're, you're, you, elect, you ran for the school committee mm -hmm. because your sole priority is the school, the schools, and you're just doing your job, right? In, in your, in your view, and um, but I do want to work together with the town because I know we are a team. But again, in past experiences, when we're you know really sharpening our pencils, we find out in the fall that we didn't have to sharpen them so much and remove things from the school that we really need. I think, as Mr. Gasper said, if you've got one-time expenditures. 
right? Mm -hmm. And that's the difference. It's programmatic, and then the fall is usually it's a one-time hit. If it's a truck, it's right. this. And the school that, can't right? do that. The school you know? can't do that one-time hit. Well, you you don't you're saying you have you're saying in the fall, and, and, we, and we could be making look. I just said we haven't ratified one damn contract yep. on this side of town, okay? So that's our business. But we haven't ratified one contract on this side of town. And let's just call out a number. Don't really care. Just call it $200,000 that we haven't factored into this budget, okay? So if technically, if we were to go to town meeting in the fall, as you were just saying in that description, mm -hmm. we technically are falsifying our budget because we haven't provided town meeting and the taxpayers of a cushion it with a balanced budget now in the spring. Okay, because it's not balanced because we haven't ratified one contract and then what's happening in the fall is you've eaten up all your revenue because of what you budgeted for and now you're going in the fall to ratify those contracts and you're doing it with free cash. Again, you're not supposed to be doing this. No, we're not. So see, that's the point I'm trying to make, Sarah, to everybody out there, not just you and, and just because we're having a conversation right now, to everybody out there, there's only so much money to go around. And, and we're falsifying what we're telling people and the taxpayers that we're, and we're not. So now we explode the budget, come the following year, you have a $200,000 deficit because if we were to ratify all our union contracts and if we were to do that in the fall. The fall town meeting, it should be only used for capital purchases if we have a fall town meeting, right? And yes, you would be able to come if you have anything in your budget for capital requests. You don't need to have that because you can say, well, we got $100,000 in capital requests, but we're going to hold off and we're going to go to fall town meeting and ask the board and put on a, an article for $100,000 of capital equipment out of whatever free cash we have. And, and I know, I'll speak for myself, we've done it before. This board has supported the school committee before on capital requests. So that's not true that the school committee can't go to town meeting in the fall and ask for money. You shouldn't be asking for budgetary money, but for capital money, Correct. absolutely. But, right, but I'm not talking about capital improvement. I'm talking about our budget. We cannot, our capital, we have two items that the school committee approved. And if that... It, I think it's $150,000 for the driveway mm -hmm. and for some roof roof repairs. Um, so, yeah, we could, but how many years have we had not had a fall meeting? It's been three years since we've had a, we haven't had a fall meeting. So that's why we haven't asked, you know, we have Brian Noble. I get it, I get it. So, I mean, we can't, we can't go, are we having a fall meeting? I'm not sure. But in the past, we always have. You know, three, four, five, five years ago we had it, but the school didn't even have capital improvements. We, we, it wasn't even existed until Brian Noble brought it to our attention. So, right. again, I mean, that's a whole other different this story, but now on. we're getting an order. Thank so. you, sorry. We, we're thank paying you. Jeff Blade to listen to our budgetary oh. <laughs> discussion. So, sorry. Uh, and I have a meeting to go to so as well. Thank you very much. Well, thank really you, Sarah. Good conversation. Good luck, gentlemen. We'll thank, be in you, touch. thank you. Thank you. All right, okay. so now we have to go over to the executive session. It's a joint meeting with the Board of Selectmen, Board of Health, and Soil Board. Uh, the motion is I move the board enter into executive session under general law, chapter 30A, section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to litigation PJ Keating, 72 South Main Street at Christian Mass, because an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares the board will not return to open session it's just a roll call vote of the board of selectmen i need everybody else you need a roll call vote of the board of selectmen then you have to do it again for the soil board okay and then the board of health has to do it all right mr gasper yes mr deroche yes and i am a yes so i have to re read the same thing for the soil board all right to the soil board, I move the board enter into executive session under general law chapter 30A, section 21A, subsection 3, to discuss strategy with respect to litigation of PJ Keating, 72 South Main Street at Christian Mass, because an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the public body and the chair so that the boards will not return to open session. Roll call vote of the soil board. Yes, Mr. Gasper. Mr. Roche? Yes. Somebody yes. No. The Board of Health? Got again. Go ahead. This is our April, April 6th Board of Health meeting. Uh, this is a joint meeting with the Board of Selectmen, Board of Health, Soil Board, ex executive session on the GL 
C3883 to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation. If an open meeting may have detrimental effect on the litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares. The boards will not return to open session. I will conduct a uh, roll call vote. Um, Mr. Medeiros? Aye. So you've got two votes to uh, yeah. from the Board of Health. That's a quorum, that's a vote. Okay. And I'm now the chair time. has yeah. to say that none of the boards will return in open session. I did right. say that. None of the boards will return in open session. Yeah, you. We are now going into executive session.